Hey everyone, I'm Supersonic 7C, and welcome to Syntax Error, the show where I analyze topics that relate to game design and try to teach viewers how to develop their games. Today I'll be talking about game feel, and more specifically how the controls aspect of gameplay affects game feel. This episode is actually the third part of a mini-series on game feel and the four aspects of gameplay that help satisfy and engage the player. Visuals, audio, controls, and how the gameplay itself is designed. I've already covered the visual and audio aspects in the previous episodes, and the episode after this one will cover the gameplay design aspect. So, if you haven't already seen the first two parts, or if you'd just like a refresher on the concept of game feel and how the visual and audio aspects of gameplay affect game feel, I recommend clicking the links in the description and watching it before continuing this video. A large part of creating good game feel comes down to how the game controls. If the controls aren't responsive and intuitive, more often than not, the game feel will completely fall apart. Very few things bother players more than unresponsive controls that suffer from input delay. When a player enters a command, they expect the corresponding action to be executed as soon as they finish inputting it, or at the very least, they expect to see a visual sign that it has started to execute. Alternatively, when players stop entering a command, they expect whatever action they were performing to stop, or at the very least, they expect to see a visual sign that it has started to stop. If they don't see either of these signs for any reason, even if this is an intentional choice, a disconnect is often created between the player and the game. Similarly, controls feel unresponsive when the player inputs a command and it fails to execute. This can be caused by a glitch, but it's usually caused by the inputted controls being delayed thanks to latency between the game, the display, and the input device. Latency, which is the delay in time it takes for data to be transferred either through the internet, through a cord, or both, isn't really a problem game developers can fix, but they can work around it by including a sort of grace period to allow commands to still be inputted. For example, say the player pressed the correct button to block an attack or jump over a gap at the very last second. Because what they're seeing on screen is delayed by a few milliseconds, and their command is also delayed by a few milliseconds, it's likely they'll fail even though they didn't do anything wrong. That normally shatters game feel, but including a grace period allows players to not be punished for inputting a command at the last second. How long the grace period should be depends on what hardware is being used, and that usually isn't limited to only one option, so it may be a good idea to include a grace period that's so big, players who inputted the command slightly late, even without latency, still aren't punished. Personally, I recommend this, but some developers see adding this big of a grace period as going too easy on the player. Regardless, I would include at least a small grace period to combat latency and help the game stay fair. Controlling the game can also feel unresponsive if the player doesn't have enough control over whatever they're playing as. One way to cause this is by not allowing players to perform certain actions at select times. This can be done effectively, but most of the time, limiting the player's controls for any reason hurts game feel and causes the gameplay to feel annoying or the controls to feel unresponsive. Even going from a fully powered or upgraded character to a weaker character when restarting a game can feel unresponsive and annoying. Because of this, I recommend devs avoid taking away power or control from the player during gameplay, and, if your game can support it, I recommend including a new game plus mode that allows players to keep some, if not all of their abilities they've already unlocked when restarting the game. Unresponsive controls are also often created when the movement of the playable character doesn't feel right and feels imprecise and off for any reason. Usually, this is caused by what's commonly referred to as floaty controls. Controls feel floaty to players when the playable character lacks the proper weight in some way, thus making movement imprecise and harder to estimate where they will stop or land. Another form of this is when controlling the playable character feels slippery. This feeling is often intentionally added in areas that contain ice, but it almost always bothers players whenever the playable character lacks friction or has too much momentum. Sometimes, unresponsive controls are also created when the gameplay feels too stiff, which means the playable character lacks the proper physics, like knockback, momentum, or the correct movement speed. To clarify, I don't mean to say that you can't have characters who float in the air, slide on ice, or move slowly. 
Yes, slow characters who float and slide may feel stiff, floaty, and slippery to control, but they don't have to, and all of these types of movement can still allow the gameplay to have good game feel. Rayman Legends pulls off all three of these examples and even pulls off taking control away from the player, but only because it compensates and always allows the player to maintain roughly the same level of control over the playable character throughout all of the gameplay. This is done in multiple ways. During floating segments and in slippery areas, the obstacles and levels are spaced farther apart to give players more time to react or a bigger margin of error. In underwater levels, the slow movement and absence of actions like floating and wall jumping is compensated by giving players more fluid control of the playable character. Although, these aren't the only ways to give players more control and prevent gameplay from feeling floaty, slippery, or stiff. You can prevent all three of these outcomes by making sure controlling the playable character has satisfying and engaging physics, momentum, and weight. Another way to prevent this is by making sure aspects like the playable character's movement speed and jump arc allow for precise controls. Doing all of this can be a very daunting task, which is why many developers use the great, extremely effective strategy of... Tri trial and error. Seriously, almost every dev keeps trying different movement speeds and physics until it feels good. Then they keep tweaking it until they believe it can't be noticeably improved. Yeah, this method can be a ton of work, and no one knows how long it'll take you, but in most cases, this is your only option because creating controls that feel good hasn't been broken down to an exact science. Maybe it will someday, but for now, to make the trial and error process easier and more efficient, I recommend programming some sort of system that allows you to quickly change how the playable character controls. You can do this however you want, but a common practice is to program player movement using three variables that can have their values changed at any time. One for the movement speed, another for the acceleration speed, and one last variable for artificial friction. You see, changing the values of these variables can help control how smooth and responsive the playable character's movement is. For example, having no acceleration when movement starts and no friction when movement stops will most likely create very stiff feeling in precise controls. Luckily, because there are values for acceleration and friction that can be easily changed at any time, you can quickly alter the gameplay until it feels smoother and precise. By the way, when changing values, I recommend that you start out making drastic changes and gradually make smaller changes until you start narrowing down what you believe are the best values. Say you try a value and it doesn't feel right, you can subtract half from it and see if that feels better. If not, then you can add half to the original value and go from there. Once you start narrowing it down, you can add or subtract a fourth and then start making minor changes when you've narrowed it down even more. Hopefully, using this method or one similar to it will help speed up the trial and error process. Just like when controls feel unresponsive, gameplay becomes less satisfying and engaging when control schemes aren't designed intuitively. In order for controlling the gameplay to feel intuitive, the controls must work in tandem with the gameplay while also being easy to understand and use no matter how complicated they are. Sadly, I can't just tell you what works well with every type of gameplay or what control schemes are the most intuitive because that answer is different for every type of game. Avoiding overcomplicated controls and explaining the control scheme in a simple and straightforward manner usually helps make the control scheme easy to understand and use, but that's not always the case. Additionally, having the control scheme follow some sort of logic that can be accurately predicted by the player without them being taught how to play the game can greatly help create intuitive controls. For example, having the right trigger in a racing game activate the gas while the left trigger activates the brake may be guessed by some players because triggers are similar to pedals in a real car and the gas pedal is on the right while the brake pedal is on the left. But not every game's control scheme can follow logic like this. Also, in general, control schemes that require players to move their hands or fingers across long distances in order to perform an action often makes the gameplay annoying or physically painful for some players, but even then this can create intuitive controls in rare cases. For these reasons, the only real advice I can offer is to test multiple control schemes no matter what, even if you've already found a control scheme that works great.
I also recommend testing the traditional or stereotypical control schemes of whatever game genres you're working with as well. These are the control schemes most people who have a general knowledge of games think of when a game genre is mentioned. To demonstrate, when I mention the genre first-person shooter, a control scheme most likely pops into your head that looks something along the lines of this. That's the traditional or stereotypical first-person shooter control scheme. Some developers believe that you should always go with the first control scheme you think of in order to find the most intuitive and avoid alienating players. Usually, this ends up being the traditional control scheme of that game genre or one very close to it. Other developers believe stereotypical control schemes like this should be avoided as much as possible to make sure devs don't rely on them too much and stop creating new control schemes. While I do see where both of these mindsets are coming from, personally, I believe traditional or stereotypical control schemes shouldn't be relied on, but I also believe they shouldn't be completely shunned. The stereotypical control schemes may not always be the best, most intuitive choice, but they usually became so widely used because of how often they can be intuitive. This is why I highly recommend testing multiple ideas including the traditional control scheme before making a decision. What might seem like the obvious answer at first may be less intuitive, may clash with the overall gameplay, or may create worse game feel in comparison to an alternate control scheme. Just imagine how different it would feel to play Super Smash Bros. using the A button to jump instead of pressing up on the joystick. Yeah, some players believe pressing A feels just as good as pressing up, and many players found this control scheme to be confusing at first, but if a more traditional fighting game control scheme was chosen, jumping may have been left out, and directional attacks could have been limited to only one type of attack, or may have never been implemented. Using the A button to jump, or any control scheme for that matter, can feel great, but in this case, using the control scheme that allows for more directional attacks and allows jumping will most likely feel better in comparison because this gives players more control over their characters and helps the gameplay become more engaging. Additionally, the greater number of attacks and jumping adds more depth to the game, while directional attacks add a greater sense of impact, which helps make attacking feel more satisfying. Game feel isn't only influenced by controls when it comes to the control scheme itself and how it feels to control the playable character. Other control-related aspects affect game feel as well. For one, how the camera moves and controls greatly affects how players feel when controlling their avatar. Different games require different types of cameras, and if the game's camera looks jarring at any point during gameplay for any reason, at best the game feel will most likely be destroyed, and at worst, the game may also become practically unplayable or cause horrible motion sickness. Some developers try to avoid this by simply giving the player control of the camera at all times. For first-person or virtual reality games, this is great and practically required, but many control schemes require the camera to be at least semi-automated, either because the player can't always play the game and adjust the camera at the same time, or because constantly controlling the camera would feel like a chore. Semi-automated and even completely automated cameras can be simple, complex, or anywhere in between. Usually, all that matters when programming and designing them is that they smoothly track the player in an efficient and intuitive way that doesn't obstruct the player's view or make it harder to control the game. Many developers try to achieve this by making sure the camera always keeps the playable character in a set area, whether that be in the middle of the screen or off to the side of it. This can work great, but in some cases, it'll make it difficult for players to react to obstacles and control the game. To solve this issue, the camera is often offset it a bit to change the position of the playable character on the screen and allow the player to see farther ahead, above, below, or behind the playable character. Additionally, if the player changes directions, the camera is programmed to shift and the position of the playable character on the screen will often flip. In some games, though, having the playable character switch screen positions every time the player changes directions can disorient the player and make precise movements harder to control. This is practically a death sentence for platformers of any kind, which is why Super Mario World includes a camera system with a lot of depth. Once the player moves the playable character to the center of the screen, assuming the character didn't start in that position, the camera will begin to move horizontally along with the player. Although, if the player changes direction, the camera won't move with the player immediately. Instead, the camera will stay still unless the player moves 16 pixels in one direction without turning around. Why 16 pixels, you ask? 
Well, I can't speak for the developers, but I'm willing to bet it's not a coincidence that the smallest platform in the game, a single block, is 16 pixels wide. Thanks to the camera moving this way, platforming is made much easier and players can precisely adjust their placement back and forth without having to worry about the camera movement throwing them off, even if they're only standing on a single block. That's not all though. Super Mario World's camera system helps make vertical movement more intuitive and easier to control as well. Whenever the player starts a level or enters a pipe, it activates a camera mode that was predetermined by the programmers of the game. There are four camera modes that all cause the camera to move differently. Under normal circumstances and when the camera isn't auto-scrolling, the first stops the screen from scrolling vertically, the second stops the screen from scrolling both vertically and horizontally, the third locks the height of the camera in reference to the bottom of the screen, and finally the fourth locks the height of the camera in reference to the last platform the player stood on. Additionally, when the camera isn't locked completely, certain actions like climbing, swimming, flying, or running and jumping at full speed will temporarily unlock the camera and allow for free vertical movement. This is meant to prevent the player from moving off screen, but in rare situations, players can go off the camera if they run up a slope or jump higher than the top of the screen. The camera can be manually panned to the right and left, but not up and down, which is a shame since the player will sometimes be forced to make a blind jump if the camera didn't move the way the developers intended. Still, while they may not be perfect, these camera modes help every level and area in the game have a camera that complements precision platforming, intuitively works well with the level design, and avoids disorienting players. So I highly encourage developers to design and implement similar camera systems into their games. Giving players more precise control over their actions by changing how long they press and hold buttons or how far they tilt joysticks is another way the controls of a game can become more satisfying and engaging. This is commonly referred to as pressure sensitivity and it gives the player an extra level of control that makes actions like regulating the height of a jump much easier and more accurate. Not only that, but pressure sensitivity can also make control schemes more efficient and intuitive. Think of it this way, say you want to make a game where you control the person's movement and have the ability to walk, run, or tiptoe. You could have the player walk by default when moving the left joystick and allow them to run by holding a button or tiptoe by holding a completely different button. This control scheme can work perfectly fine, but if the player wants to run or tiptoe for an extended period of time, they may get tired of holding the buttons. You could just have a button toggle between the different movement speeds, but toggling could get pretty annoying, especially if players accidentally press the button one too many times. Instead, solving the problem by implementing pressure sensitivity would allow the player to just tilt the joystick slightly to tiptoe, tilt it all the way to run, and use all the tilt angles in between to walk. Assuming this pressure sensitivity method doesn't clash with the gameplay, it would make the control scheme far more efficient and intuitive while also making the game more engaging and satisfying. Other than all of this, using different input devices or controllers can also affect game feel by giving players physical feedback. Motion controllers, virtual reality headsets, touchscreens, and other specialized input devices can all greatly immerse players and help keep them engaged. Using special input devices meant to mimic certain objects like a fishing rod, an arcade machine, or an instrument can even help satisfy players. Although, all of these input devices can bother players and cause the controls to feel unintuitive and annoying if they're not properly implemented into the gameplay or if the gameplay has no reason to be controlled in this way. Because of this, I highly recommend not including them for the sake of following a fad or trying to be different and only including them if it would truly improve the gameplay. Also, not everyone owns these devices, so keep in mind that if there's no option to use traditional input devices like a keyboard and mouse or controller, and if the alternate input device isn't guaranteed to be present, many players will be completely prevented from playing your game. Luckily, there are a few other ways traditional input devices can give the player physical feedback. Many games use control schemes or certain buttons and joysticks to mimic actions. For example, holding a button down to charge an attack, using a keyboard's number pad to enter a password, or even repeatedly hitting an object to open it can all give players physical feedback. Having the input device vibrate can also help improve game feel by giving the player physical feedback. 
Vibration can be used to make games more engaging by accompanying certain actions like something exploding nearby or the player landing on the ground from a large drop. The intensity and speed of vibration can also be regulated to make the game more engaging or satisfying. Countless games make great use of vibration and add a large amount of impact to the game by causing the controller to vibrate in short bursts when massive creatures perform certain actions like walking or striking the ground. In Little Big Planet, when players get close to hazards, the controller will start to vibrate and increase the vibration intensity as the player gets closer to the hazard, which helps make the gameplay more engaging and the controls more intuitive. Some controllers even allow you to regulate which sides of the controller vibrate. This can be used in a racing game to accompany when the player starts driving on grass instead of the road. Touching the grass on the left could cause the left side of the controller to rumble, touching the grass on the right could cause the right side of the controller to rumble, and completely driving on grass could cause the entire controller to rumble. Using the controller vibration in ways like this can greatly improve the game feel and make the gameplay much more engaging. Like all of the four aspects, it's extremely rare that controls alone will be enough to create satisfying and engaging gameplay without being complemented by at least one other aspect. This can be pulled off in countless ways. Controls often harmonize with the visuals when inputting a command gives the player visual feedback. Controls also often harmonize with the audio when inputting a command gives the player auditory feedback. Additionally, controls often harmonize with the gameplay design when it's easy to understand how to play the actual game and when controlling the game gives players a sense of accomplishment. I highly recommend harmonizing as many aspects as possible, but as long as the controls harmonize with one or more of the other gameplay aspects, good game feel is usually achieved. On the next episode of Syntax Error, I'll be concluding this mini-series on game feel by talking about the final aspect that affects game feel, the gameplay design aspect. I've been Supersonic7CE, and hopefully I'll see you next time.